Good afternoon to all. I'm Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association. Let me warmly welcome all of you uh, for this very important webinar organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association under its webinar series. Uh, the, um, we know that we are amidst a pandemic and we are at a time that we have achieved some control of the, uh, uh, this, the so-called third wave, uh, but uh, at the uh, 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 peak of the wave, we all were anxious that whether the hospitals could get overflowed and uh, whether uh, the capacity could be overwhelmed and that whether we would lose or whether the, uh, the health se se sector would collapse because the number of admissions were uh, uh, beyond our control. Therefore, we had to move uh, to the home care as well. So now we have uh, two sets of patients, the inward patients as well as home patients. So as we started giving care for home patients, it became necessary or it became, it became uh, more uh, 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 subject of all professionals. I mean, as long as the patients were in hospitals, it's only the physicians or internal medicine doctors and the doctors working under them who took care of the uh, patients as well as other physicians in hospital. Whereas as we started taking care of patients at home, then it became a uh, problem of the profession, and it became important for all of us to be uh, up to date on management issues because there are patients known to all of us being managed at home. Uh, so uh, uh, it is in that setting that we realize that this long COVID also has become a very important and interesting topic for medical professionals. So based on that, we thought that it's the time for us to talk to uh, our medical professionals on long, long COVID. I'm glad that since we have started the presentations on the Zoom platform, uh, we see the enthusiasm of doctors to be up to date. I mean, the audience, we are not never short of audience, even for this, that we see a very good participation for this uh, uh, webinar. So we would be talking to you today on uh, 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 post-COVID syndromes. We have lined up two eminent uh, clinicians and specialists. Our first speaker would be Dr. Amal Ratnapala, uh, consultant chest physician from National Hospital Kandy. Dr. Amal Ratnapala would talk to us on pulmonary and other complications following COVID-19 infection. So over to you, Dr. Amal Ratnapala. I uh, very much thank you for uh, uh, consenting to share your expertise uh, with our uh, uh, audience uh, and uh, uh, deciding to spend your valuable time on this subject. So over to you, Dr. Amal Ratnapala. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Vijit Senaratna, uh, Senior Consultant in Respiratory Medicine, for inviting me uh, for uh, to share my expertise on uh, post covid syndromes. Uh, I'd like to share my screen. Uh, yeah. Um, today we are going to discuss about the post covid syndromes. So I'll be mainly focusing about the pulmonary syndromes. And uh, these are my disclosures. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to discuss about the epidemiological model that has been uh, put forward by uh, one of the senior uh, epidemiologists in uh, America about uh, the COVID. As you can see here, currently we are facing this uh, acute pandemic of COVID pneumonia. And with time, of course, with the introduction of the vaccination and other strategies, that will go down. But hence, we are facing another uh, uh, breakthrough or pandemic of pulmonary fibers, as you can see here. Uh, <clears throat> basically, I mean, you are aware about 95% of the people uh, will either have mild to moderate symptoms or no symptoms, or 5% will develop severe or critical symptoms. Uh, among these 5%, uh, we are aware that at least 20% will uh, disease, and about 30% will uh, fully recover. But again, the main worry is that nearly 30 to 50% 
ill steal of uh, what you call this palmitic fibers of post covid uh, lung disease there is significant amount that we are going to face and there will be quite a lot of patients who with us who are on oxygen and who are on various treatments and who are breathless uh, who can't do their daily activities it will be another uh, pandemic that we are uh, global so <clears throat> this is been introduced by uh, uh, dr udavadia he is one of the uh, respiratory specialist in india he published his article in lung india and he talk uh, post covid pulmonary fibrosis as a tsunami that comes after the uh, uh, this big uh, earthquake of uh, covid pneumonia so we have to prepare for this tsunami these are my objectives initially i'll be discussing about um, uh, i'll be discussing about covid and lung injury then i'll be discussing about uh, the post covid pulmonary syndromes as well as i'll be mainly focusing about this post covid lung for post covid infectious lung disease uh, we have to identify we have to understand this covid and lung injury this concept very well because this is the time that we are creating a patients with lung fibrosis so unfortunately there are two hits that our lung is or our body is faced with a covid the first hit is the epithelial or alveolar injury and the second hit is endothelial injury epithelial injury i mean as you are aware when the sars coronavirus 2 is uh, exposed to our respiratory epithelium it is uh, subjected to uh, ace2 receptors in our epithelium and then then uh, there's a cascade of uh, inflammation predominantly driven by the t lymphocytes as well as the macrophages which will result in a hyper inflammatory uh, syndrome this hyper inflammatory syndrome is one of the classical a uh, hyper inflammatory syndrome that we have never seen during our lifetime this uh, building gun uh, group uh, from america they have studied about this hyper inflammatory syndrome and they have compared it with influenza pneumonia for example the patients who are uh, infected with influenza they'll get a peak of cytokine uh, storm and then it will resolve within a few days to weeks and it will come to the baseline but unfortunately the patients with sars coronavirus 2 pneumonia or covid pneumonia what we can see is actually it leads to a delayed uh, immune response and then that response will persist for long the time uh, sometimes days weeks and sometimes we see for months even and in this study again they have uh, identified the cumulative cytokine exposure in a patient with influenza pneumonia compared to the covid pneumonia as you can see the amount of cytokines that they are going to expose during uh, this uh, covid pneumonia is at least uh, three fold when compared to that of influenza pneumonia so we are going to face a, a <clears throat> very new as well as a significant uh, pneumonia which we have never seen before and this secondary injury is caused by this hyper inflammation or this immune response i'm sure you all aware of this uh, staging of this uh, covid 19 this is uh, the stage 1 of the covid 19 this is is the early infection where the, where the viremic response or viremic phase it lasts about 5 to 7 days and then there's uh, when the virus load is going down the patient start the inflammatory response during the phase 2 which lasts for about 7 uh, days to 14 days that is the pulmonary phase where the patient is developing breathlessness as well as hypoxia and when they go to the stage 3 that is the hyper inflammatory phase where the patients develop organ failures acute respiratory distress syndromes uh, circulatory shock cardiac failure and systemic inflammatory response syndrome and all these things are driven by the inflammatory response and at that point the viral or viral load is uh, significantly low therefore if i summarize the epithelial injury that is caused by uh, covid 19 significant evidence that there is a prolonged exposure to cytokines and there is a prolonged hyperinflammation which is leading to uh, epithelial or alveolar injury which leads to structural damage but unfortunately we as clinicians we also helping this epithelial injury basically by two ways the first is the nosocomial infections hospital acquired infections i'm sure 
most of these COVID pneumonia patients at the initial stage they receive quite a lot of antibiotics and quite a lot of high end antibiotics which are which usually are going to uh, uh, affect negatively because it will introduce multi organ resistant organisms once the patient is staying with us for longer time in our hospital so therefore as clinician we should avoid early introduction of antibiotics as well as early introduction of steroids I mean, that is we are doing more harm by introducing early steroids when the patients are not hypoxic and not uh, at the pulmonary phase Secondly, by inappropriate ventilation, and uh, we are introducing the ventilator-induced lung injury as well as self-inflicted lung injury by them. Also, we are introducing epithelial injury and structural damage. So remember, a significant proportion uh, this hyperinflammation is causing epithelial and alveolar damage. But we, as clinicians, are introducing or contributing to this epithelial injury by uh, introducing nosocomial infections. For inappropriate antibiotic prescribing as inappropriate immunosuppression and immunomodulators as well as inappropriate ventilatory strategies. So this is a patient, a 44-year-old patient who has a presenter with COVID pneumonia and he's in post-COVID lung. As you can see, uh, there are areas of traction from cases as well as crown glass and interlobular and interlobular septal thickening, evidence of dense fibrosis as well as pleural fibrosis as well. So every aspect of the lung is fibrosis. On this patient because of this inflammatory response. The second most unique uh, injury that COVID causing, in fact, this has been never reported uh, before with other viral pneumonias, that is the endothelial injury. So I must <coughs> uh, kind of thank this uh, Ackerman and group from America, where they have studied this pulmonary vascular endotheliitis, thrombosis and and so Genesis in COVID-19, which is published in 2020 in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, where they have, uh, they have enlightened us about the uniqueness of this virus, right? how it affects the vascular endothelium. And uh, this is a post-mortem analysis. And this, they, have, uh, they had a control arm of uh, uh, patients who died from uh, viral pneumonia other than COVID-19. And uh, then they had a, another uh, aspect of uh, patients who died from COVID pneumonia. So these are patients who died from COVID pneumonia, as you can see here, there is a, a microthrombosis in this uh, slide, as you can see, in the pulmonary vasculature, multiple microthrombosis. This is one of the pathological phenomena that we see in COVID-19. Again, this is uh, electro -micro my electron microscopic view of the capillary endothelium. You can see this is a normal person who, uh, normal control and this is actually a patient who had COVID pneumonia as you can see there's a uh, destruction of the uh, vascular endothelium here you can see the sprouting of new vessels which you see in COVID pneumonia so these are again they have evaluated the accumulative angiogenesis uh, they have compared in a patient with COVID-19 with that of other viral pneumonias as well as patients who had Industrial lung disease, due to other causes, especially they have taken patients with NSIP. So, as you can see here, they have significant uh, amount of new vessel formation or angiogenesis compared to that of other viral pneumonias, as well as compared to patients with other interstitial lung diseases. So, if I summarize again, the endothelial injury that we see in patients with uh, pulmonary uh, uh, pneumonia as pulmonary endotheliitis, and there is thrombosis and angiogenesis, which leads to breakdown of the alveolar barrier, as well as it leads to a non cardiogenic These two mechanisms are involved in, in lung damage, not only the lung damage, almost other organ damages. Here again, we as clinicians, we also introduce uh, our the part for this uh, alveolar breakdown or breakdown of these capillary membranes. So that is the main, the main reason uh, when nitrogenic uh, factor is dehydration. So therefore, it's very important once you are managing a patient with COVID pneumonia, you have to avoid dehydration at any cost. We see quite commonly the patients are significantly dehydrated uh, when they come to our uh, setting to the ICUs or high, high dependency units because that dehydration promotes microscopic thrombosis. So there is a patient uh, with uh, this uh, significant uh, breathlessness and the CT shows 
non cardiogenic pulmonary edema. As you can see here, there's increased amount of ground glass in the lung bases in the dependent areas as well as in the artificial regions. So, <clears throat> epithelial damage and uh, unique endothelial damage, which leads to recovery in some patients, but about 20% will die, but uh, 30 to 50% of the patients develop post COVID pulmonary syndrome because of these uh, two mechanisms or two hit hypothesis. Uh, the CDC has been recognized that at least one in 11 patients again readmitted to the same hospital within two months who have been discharged with COVID pneumonia. So that led to a further evaluation of this post COVID syndrome. So, how to define a post COVID syndrome? So, this actually is an excellent paper published in uh, Nature Reviews. And uh, this they have uh, discussing about the viremic load as well as the symptoms and the post COVID symptoms. Usually, we define the acute COVID phase from day zero of symptom onset to the uh, 28 days or four weeks. And after four weeks, if the patients are having persistent symptoms, actually, we consider as post COVID. And that is also further divided into acute or subacute post COVID, that is from four weeks to 12 weeks. And from 12 weeks to six months is considered as a chronic or post COVID. And then six months onward, we consider as persistent COVID. So there are, it can affect any organ in your body. So the commonest is fatigue and declining in the quality of life, muscular weakness, uh, joint pain, dyspnea, cough, and so on and so forth. And so this <laughs> study further evaluated about these post-COVID phases. It is contributing, I mean, it is uh, discussing about three phases of post-COVID syndrome. The post-COVID phase one, which is uh, extending for four weeks to 12 weeks, acute post-COVID, and then long or chronic post-COVID leads to 24th week, that is usually six months, and six months onward, that is phase three, or the persistent post-COVID syndrome. If you consider the post-COVID syndrome, and see during acute pain. The fatigue is one of the commonest symptoms. However, that in, even in the post COVID follow up, fatigue is the commonest syndrome and symptom actually that about 60% of the patients, they have a post COVID symptom of fatigue. And breathless is the second most commonest symptom in uh, acute COVID, as well as you can see about 50% of the patients who have been discharged with COVID pneumonia complaining of breathlessness. So once these patients come to us, we evaluate uh, these patients and we take a history and do we do the basic evaluation, including lung functions, walk test, x-ray, as well as uh, uh, some of the the syndromes. There are at least three pulmonary syndromes that we classify these patients into. The first syndrome is a post-COVID bronchial hyperreactivity syndrome which is quite similar to asthma. The second one, or the most significant one, is the post-COVID ILD, which I'm going to discuss in, uh, in detail, and then the post-COVID pulmonary hypertension. If you consider the post-COVID bronchial hyperreactivity syndrome, it is, uh, it is uh, equivalent to asthma. Most of the patients will get breathlessness when they are exposed to cold or when they're having, uh, uh, having a cold bath, or it is uh, with dynal variation that is usually lasting for at least three weeks to three months. And, it, and uh, this is a classical extra for patient who presented with post-COVID uh, uh, bronchial hyperreactivity syndrome, as you can see here, the volume of the lungs seem to be expanded, diaphragms are flat, and uh, it is hyper, it kind of, uh, there's expansion of the lung. So this is a patient with uh, a volume expansion or AR trapping due to this uh, post-COVID hyperreactivity syndrome. And most of the time, this patient will respond to a lot of steroids along with the dilators. And then not only uh, this, but also there's a high, there's, because of this hyperinflammation, which is leading to uncontrolled symptoms of asthma and allergic And most of the time we see patients who are diagnosed with asthma or asthma COPD overlap or allergic rhinitis was controlled symptoms and coming with uncontrolled features of uh, asthma or uncontrolled features of allergic rhinitis purely because of this hyperinflammation uh, late to this uh, of this uh, asthma and allergic rhinitis. 
the post-COVID pulmonary hypertension that is an evolving uh, area actually that there are several case reports published as well as uh, whether it's a sequel of uh, corona and there's increasing amount of collecting uh, their data is collected about this patient who are having pulmonary hypertension and this could be pulmonary arterial hypertension that is a group one pulmonary hypertension or it could be group three because of the hypoxia due to uh, lung fibrosis or it could be even group uh, four because of the uh, chronic pulmonary embolism however uh, this is an evolving area and uh, still we don't know fully about this post called pulmonary hypertension but it is going to be a significant uh, a pulmonary syndrome that we are going to face with. So I'm focusing mainly about the post-COVID interstitial lung disease syndrome. Uh, initially, there was a significant, or there's, uh, there's quite a lot of argument between the academics, whether this is resolving or remnants of uh, uh, changes that we see in pneumonia at the initial phase, or is it a separate entity? But we have, this is a separate syndrome. There is evidence of persistent physiological impairment in this patient. That for that, if it is a pneumonia, if it is resolving a pneumonia, and there should not be physiological impairment in these patients. Now we know there's persistent physiological impairment. And then yeah, then there is evidence of persistent radiological abnormalities, besides your fibrosis. That is also unique and some of the radiological changes are progressing irrespective of the resolution of the coid pneumonia. And then there is evidence of biomarkers which are persistently positive in these patients, which are quite common. And we see these biomarkers in other patients with uh, uh, interstitial lung diseases or other cause of pulmonary fibrosis. And then there are shared genetic uh, dysfunction in these patients. Nine compared with the uh, other patients with lung fibro. So there's a genetic predisposition and there's biomarker predisposition. There's a persistent functional impairment as well as persistent radiological abnormalities. Therefore, we consider this post-COVID lung fibros as a separate syndrome itself. There is a study done uh, uh, by a, a team of researchers and published in uh, the International Journal of Medicine. And here, what they found actually, they have done uh, extensive physiological screening of patients following post-COVID after two to three months from their COVID pneumonia. So what they found, the statistic, and also that there's a control arm, the patients with uh, other viral pneumonias, predominantly patients with influenza has been studied. So after two months, as you can see in lung functions, there's in COVID pneumonia, there's a significant restrictive abnormality compared to the uh, pneumonia. Those are less common compared to the viral pneumonia, but that is significant. But diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide or the, uh, the diffusion capacity is significantly higher in the patients with uh, post-COVID uh, lung disease compared to other viral pneumonia. So we know there's a predominant restrictive abnormality as well as the predominant diffusion abnormality in these patients. These again study uh, done uh, and published in Lancet 2021, which they have found. It is done in China. And uh, as you can see here, the blue color is six months lung function impairment and uh, orange is a 12 month lung function impairment. As you can see here, the, there's persistent diffusion capacity abnormality, yeah, diffusion abnormality in these patients. And also that you can see the uh, functional post vital capacity also persistently impaired in these patients. This is a study, again, done by the same group in China, uh, published in Lancet 2021. And uh, this is, again, suggestive of persistent radiological abnormalities after 12 months, and six months of severe COVID pneumonia. As you can see, some of the uh, abnormalities like rhine and irregular lines and fibrotic areas, all these things are increasing compared to the six months. So the radiological changes are progressing more time. So this is a separate syndrome. And the biomarker study <clears throat> done uh, in, again in China, as you can see, there are biomarkers of epithelial injury, biomarkers of uh, epithelial injury fibrosis, as well as epithelial repair. All these biomarkers are significantly elevated 
in these patients with coiled uh, pulmonary fibrosis. And these biomarkers are the same biomarkers that we see in patients with interstitial lung diseases due to other causes. The genes, this is surprising, this study. Uh, what we found actually 14 out of 15 genes associated with lung fibrosis due to other causes, predominantly IPA, has been associated with COVID-19 fibrosis. So these patients have a genetic similarity to the patients who are going into the lung fibrosis due to other causes. So therefore, now uh, the global academia, we have developed a post-COVID ILD model. Now we know the patients who are developing lung fibrosis and who are developing post-COVID ILD. I discuss about this model. And so when the patient exposed to uh, COVID-19 and there's a monocyte macrophage and lymphocyte activation, and if there is a genetic predisposition on these patients, particularly patients who are elderly, or aging more than 60 years, and then when there's severe pneumonia involved, these patients are going into epithelial injury, and this epithelial and the injury, which release cytokines, chemokines, immune and inflammatory cells, and certain group of patients go into activation of migration, percolation of fibroblasts, and certain of patients actually, they go into uh, deposition of extracellular matrix, secretion, organizing, and remodeling. So therefore, your prevention of post-COVID pulmonary fibrosis starts at the time of prevention of COVID itself, and then prevention of the inflammation, of management at the pneumonia. So the management of COVID pneumonia is significantly, it is really important to prevent your post-COVID lung fibrosis. So this is the stage. I mean, all your lockdown and all the other measures, the wearing mask and everything prevent you from getting COVID and the vaccination also will prevent kind of your inflammatory response to a certain degree. But once you develop the pneumonia and this is the stage that we do, It's hyperinflammation that you have to manage with the immune modulators. Remember, please do not introduce nosocomial infections by introducing inappropriate steroids, inappropriate immunomodulators as well as inappropriate antibiotics at the early stage. And also prevent ventilator-induced lung injuries as, as much as possible, and also prevent dehydration on this patient. So therefore, remember to prevent post-coid lung. It's only the immunomodulators that we should the parameters and we should care these patients, we should hydrate this patient and we should avoid unnecessary treatments for this patient. By this model, now we know there are two phenotypes of post-COVID ILD. The first phenotype is the, the phenotype where there is increased deposition of extracellular matrix, secretion and organization and remodeling of this uh, lung that is known as uh, early autoimmune ILD. One ILD phenotype, the other phenotype is actually activation, migration, perforation of fibroblasts. That phenotype that is the early fibrotic phenotype. So we have two phenotypes of ILD in these patients. So these are some of the expressions that presented to us actually uh, to Candy. The 74 year old male who has diabetes, uh, who's presented with MMRC3 breathlessness for four weeks duration, and the patient gives a history of uh, cough and upper respiratory uh, symptoms about eight weeks back, but not tested for COVID because the patient was vaccinated before and uh, the symptoms are spontaneously resolved, but the patient came about eight weeks after to us with worsening shortness of breath of MMRC3. And here, what we see, see in this patient, what we saw in this patient, here you can see there's increased amount of ground glass as well as constellations which are distributed around the uh, uh, bronchial vessels and brown lobules of the pulmonary tree. And uh, this is uh, known as uh, uh, COVID uh, organizing pneumonia. This patient was treated with steroids. And after about uh, two months, about, about six to eight weeks, with the second CT scan, you can see that it is uh, almost resolved with residual changes. So, this is the first phenotype I was talking about. And the second patient, actually 68 year old lady with diabetes, present with severe COVID pneumonia, required non invasive ventilation and persistent oxygen requirement. And following four, four weeks of uh, initial presentation, we have done a CT scan. This initial CT scan actually is, shows again uh, perilobular consolidation, so this of, cons uh, of 
suggestive of uh, organizing pneumonia. And then the follow-up CT in about uh, four, to eight, four to eight weeks time showed areas of uh, traction and fibrosis. So therefore, there are two post-COVID ILD phenotypes that we should recognize uh, in these patients, the early autoimmune phenotype and the early fibrotic phenotype. The early autoimmune uh, phenotype Basically, it is uh, due to the immune inflammatory cascade. As you uh, know, there's a evasion of the epithelial component, there's epithelial damage, and evasion of the endothelial component, there's endothelial damage. And these patients have abundant lymphocyte infiltrate. And uh, if you do a bronchoalveolarize, they'll show lymphocytosis. And uh, in the radiology, they will show the organizing pneumonia like pattern. And uh, the treatment is immunomodulation. Basically, these patients are. <clears throat> steroid responders, and uh, they have excellent response to steroids. And most of these patients actually, we see persistent, uh, significant proportion of these patients have persistent ANA positivity. Remember, any viral infection can activate your ANA levels or ANA positivity, but these patients have a, a persistent ANA positivity, which you do the, if you do the test in three months, and they have a positive ANA levels. And then the early fibrotic phenotype. That is usually, again, uh, patients uh, who are having pre-existing ILDs or pre-existing conditions which can promote ILD, for example, like who are smokers and elderly, especially uh, men, and with exposure to various other uh, inorganic or organic dust. So these patients actually, once you get the COVID, they'll have uh, 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 post-COVID uh, fibrotic patterns. And these patients actually, uh, if they are progressing, and we might try to consider these antifibrotic therapies. So what are the therapeutic implications by phenotyping post-COVID dialysis? So for example, once you get a patient with post-COVID dialysis, now we know they share common genes and they share common biomarkers and they share this common two-hit uh, injury hypothesis that, we, that is known for other interstitial lung diseases. Therefore, what I'm suggesting, and globally it is happening, and uh, especially in Europe and UK, uh, we should discuss this situation in the MPT, where the pulmonologist, radiologist, and as well as immunologist should come together and discuss these patients and reclassify these ILDs according to the current ILD classification. If the patient is having autoimmune, autoinflammatory type, Remember our objective of treatment to achieve complete remission. We are, we are not going to uh, uh, treat partially appropriate treatment. You know that systemic steroid dosing with gradual tailing off dosing can almost completely uh, resolve these uh, pneumonias or organizing pneumonias in early autoinflammatory type. But there's significant lower proportion could go into fibrotic uh, phase, but still majority, more than 90% of the time, if you have treated appropriately with these things, steroids, these patients can be cured completely. The second pattern, this study conducted in Italy, uh, they have uh, collected all the data of uh, post-COVID dialysis and they are phenotyped against uh, this early autoimmune as well as early fibrotic phenotypes and early fibrotic phenotypes has been reclassified according to the available uh, ILD classification. There, they have identified about 11% of the patients are having fibrotic NSIP and OP, about 6% of the patients were indeterminate for UIP, and about 1% had definite UIP. And uh, so these patients actually, you might have to consider antifibrotic therapies early if the patients are actually uh, progressing. Our objective of these patients to achieve independence from long-term oxygen therapy, as most of the patients uh, on this fibrotic phase are having uh, are on oxygen therapies, actually. So our aim is to make them independent of, from oxygen and also at least achieve a partial remission to make their daily reactivities uh, and to achieve stability. So these patients, we don't have any indication to start antifibrotic early, and there are four trials at the moment answering this question, but at least if they're not responding to steroids, and there you have to consider antifibrotics early in these patients. So with this, uh, all the evidence, this is actually, we develop a model for managing these patients with uh, post-COVID ILD. And uh, this is, I mean, this, this has been not uh, a science, I mean, 
uh, studied it, but this is uh, from all, all, of, all, all evidence that what we uh, gathered uh, from the literature. So once the patient with post lung, uh, 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 lung fibrosis comes to you, for example, a patient is coming with breathlessness with, uh, after a COVID infection, you should evaluate this patient. You trigger clinical, you should assess the patient clinically, you ask about the patient's severity of symptoms and uh, the COVID status in the past, as well as you have to ask about other risk factors for interstitial lung disease in these patients. For example, whether these patients are having any other autoimmune features like you know, the joint pains, as well as any dry uh, eyes, dry mouth, brain or phenomena, history of uh, previous uh, miscarriages, as well as uh, exposure to various inorganic and organic drugs. So when a patient comes with, comes to with uh, post-COVID breathlessness, you should take a detailed history about their breathlessness, their onset of symptoms, their severity, associated factors, worsening or aggravating factors, delaying factors, as well as other possible etiologies has to be evaluated. If there is uh, any evidence of possible contributory factors other than COVID, you should screen these patients for the etiologies. For example, doing uh, autoimmune antibody levels or AMA levels uh, or uh, rheumatoid tract and things like that are advisable if you are thinking there is a particular autoimmune or any other uh, related exposure to this patient. And then describe the patient's HRCT pattern along with the functional assessment of uh, lung functions, DLCO, as well as walk test. And please uh, discuss with your radiologist or discuss with the immunologist and discuss with your pathologist and come to a diagnosis whether it is an early autoimmune pattern that we are seeing or whether it is an early fibrotic pattern in the class. And then reclassify again uh, with the, the current IAD classification. If it is early autoimmune disease, depending on severity, you might consider higher doses of systemic steroids. Usually we consider about 0.75, one milligram per kg, or sometimes we might consider IV methyl prednisolone. And then if it is early fibrotic, again, our treatment of choice is uh, steroids initially, and then follow up assessment in about uh, eight to 12 weeks time. And then uh, if the patients are having persistent uh, immune features in the CT scan, you might have to escalate in suppression. Remember, there are no evidence yet uh, for this. We are collecting evidence, but still we don't have any uh, kind of uh, randomized control trials. So this is the area of evolution. So for various other micro immune suppressions like microphenolate and cyclovosmid, things like that. But still, you might discuss uh, about the uh, possibility of adding these drugs at that point. And if the patient is going into the fibrotic phase or the patient is having any evidence of progressive fibrosis in their lungs, then you might consider antifibrotic therapies at that stage for the early fibrotic pattern. And sometimes this autoimmune feature, autoimmune interstitial lung disease might shift to this uh, fibrotic ILE pattern with the treatment in a small minority, and that might we might consider. Remember, there are uh, there's a single study published about antifibrotics in Japan. That study did not show significant benefit uh, of starting this drug, but that is single center observational study. But there are four randomized control studies are going on for the time being for antifibro. So I'm re requesting you all, if you are considering, especially pulmonologists, if you are considering antifibrotics, please uh, consider. Uh, uh, data collection of these patients as because we don't have any uh, RCT evidence for this. So if I summarize my talk, uh, <clears throat> it is important. COVID is not giving all the drugs at the same time. COVID success depending on identifying the right patient at the right time onset. For example, even if you consider antivirals like remdesivir, you have to give it early. If you're going to go to you have to get early and uh, steroids and the patient is hypoxic. So identify the patient correctly, identify the patient at the right time and uh, give the right treatment and uh, please uh, give it for the right outcome. So this is the success story of COVID and uh, not giving all the drugs for all the patients. So I'd like to conclude my uh, presentation here. And uh, again, I thank for audience as well as uh, uh, the SLMA for inviting me for this topic. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Amila. Uh, I think we'll move on to our next speaker uh, because of the interest of time. Uh, our next speaker is uh, 
Dr. Gota Beeranasinghe, consultant uh, cardiologist from National Hospital of Sri Lanka. He would be talking to us on cardiac complications uh, following COVID-19. Gota, over to you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, can. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. First of all, I must thank uh, 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 for, for inviting me for this uh, webinar. I must thank uh, SLMA and the Madam President, uh, Padma Gunaratna. And so I was supposed to uh, speak on cardiovascular complication or post COVID. I, I, I changed slightly this word uh, as long COVID. And uh, so you'll understand why I think previous speaker also elaborated very well why he call it long COVID. So this is what I'm going to discuss, just an overview of uh, long COVID. And uh, so then it's cardiac complications and then management briefly and conclusion, uh, keeping with time. And this is where, uh, the, where we are now and uh, the COVID. And then we are all in red zone. It's a huge uh, the health burden and uh, the impact on the economy and the livelihood of people is unprecedented. And so when it, I mean, I'm not going to explain everything uh, in details about the COVID pathophysiology and all, but uh, this is just roughly acute COVID. We know that uh, symptoms last for about four weeks after starting the illness, then it carry on ongoing symptoms of COVID. And uh, so then up to about uh, four to uh, 12 weeks after acute illness, then go into long COVID and the various definitions, but anyway, so it changes and, but like at the moment, long COVID usually defined as symptoms develop during or after COVID-19 continue beyond 12 weeks after illness start. And uh, so, uh, so you have to make sure that there is no other uh, diagnosis coming to uh, overlap here. And uh, so as I told you, signs and symptoms that uh, develop during or after an infection consistent with COVID-19, which continue more than 12 weeks, uh, actually it's long COVID. And uh, so you have to make sure that there's no other diagnosis, like in case of as previous speaker mentions, respiratory, so asthmatic, chronic obstructive lung disease, and in cardiac, existing cardiac uh, diseases, so you have to exclude. And it has to be coming from uh, original COVID infection. And uh, it's, it's a, it's a very complex disease, I believe. It's the, some define it as a multi as, as, as far as cardiovascular disease is concerned. It's a multi-system thrombombolic disease, and uh, so some even believe that the cause yet unknown. This long COVID thing, some believe this is chronic inflammation. Maybe it's like uh, autoimmune, but we all know that it's a kind of a complex interplay among uh, coagulopathy, endotheliopathy and the inflammation. It's, it's a very complex phenomenon. And uh, so we will try to explain a little bit of that. And the prevalence varies. Various reports from various countries, various studies, various observational data shows it's about 5 to 30% of COVID patients go into um, the long COVID. The increased risk for long COVID usually happens with pre-existing cardiovascular disease and people who are having already cardiovascular disease. And uh, so diabetic, obese, the, people, the obese people, and uh, so hypertensive people, they, are, they, are, they, they, they run a high risk for this particular long COVID condition. And also remember that people who have high risk, though these categories of people, they run a, the outcome is also not as uh, good as uh, the patient did not, who did not have uh, these uh, the risk factors. And so when it comes to manifestations, so I'm supposed to talk about cardiovascular manifestations and the impact. And so we all know, even the previous speaker highlighted that the muscular skeletal system is affected, nervous system is affected, respiratory system is affected, the skin, even autoimmune. And so that's why some define this as an autoimmune condition. And uh, so what I'm going to concentrate very much on cardiovascular uh, manifestation. So this is just a tough idea uh, about the manifestation and there are the cardiovascular 
uh, the manifestation I'm going to talk about, you can see that there's a variety of, uh, the, I mean, diverse uh, symptoms. Di the whole the system of the body is affected. But remember that respiratory and cardiovascular uh, systems are mostly uh, affected. The out of cardiovascular, uh, the, uh, the system, I think manifestation wise, and maybe I'm going to talk about the myocarditis picture, heart failure, and uh, ischemic heart disease. Uh, picture and uh, so um, so persistent symptoms can be like even in uh, the, during post covid period or long covid period they can have palpitation these are the commonest symptoms as previous speaker highlighted the dyspnea and chest pain they may not be having cardiovascular issue but still they might complain of these symptoms and then come to a cardiologist and so the long sequel the real ones are like myocarditis myocardial ischemia the deep in thrombosis and pulmonary embolism and some arrhythmias. The POTS, I will speak to you about what POTS is like uh, later on. And then the broken heart syndrome. Then that's another thing people talk about this broken heart syndrome. I'll tell you what it is. And so this is the interaction between um, cardiovascular disease and COVID-19. It's a very complex thing. No one knows exactly what it is. But now people have understood it's a, it's a kind of a uh, the interplay, very complex interplay between uh, the coagulation system, endothelium, endothelium, as well as uh, the inflammation of all the, uh, the organs. And so affecting mainly the, the respiratory system and cardiovascular system. And uh, so thereby you get all these complications, ischemic heart disease and uh, the arrhythmias, myocarditis and thromboembolic uh, phenomena. So when it comes to myocarditis, and so this is how it happens. And so virus infect the lung and they are like immune response and then you get the cytokine storms, inflammatory cells, autoantibodies. And so these all affected various organs. So this particular study published in the European Heart Journal, you can see the various type of uh, inflammatory response. Even with the virus in the myocardium, you can see the like lymphocytic uh, the predominance myocarditis without the virus, with the virus. I mean, this study, they have analyzed very carefully the how it affects and what's, what are the type of uh, this inflammatory response in the, uh, the, in, the, in the myocardium. And so cytokines play a part and autoantibodies play a part and so all that. It's a very complex uh, thing in, even in myocardium. But one thing is certain. So cells are uh, infl inflamed and endothelium cell that is inflamed and there can be cell necrosis as well as you can see the microembolizations in the, uh, the capillaries. And so again, the myocardial injury and the biomarkers, you can see, I mean, this, this particular study, again, shows how the biomarkers uh, could be elevated uh, in um, uh, the, this, when there, is a, when there is a myocarditis, when there's a picture of myocarditis in patients with long COVID. And this, remember that is about 30% of patients in this particular study. Uh, so they had the, 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 the myocarditis picture and there they, they checked the troponin uh, B and P as well as uh, CPKNB. I mean, these are all cardio-specific uh, biomarkers. You, could, you can see in these charts is statistically significant this uh, in patients with um, uh, the statistically significant numbers had uh, the, the, these elevated bio, the biomarkers. And uh, so also when you have this cardiac picture, I mean, you don't see sometimes this, this uh, elaborate very well, this picture, you can see the percentage of people who had various components, whether they had the myocarditis and they sometimes they had the pericarditis, they had the ischemic components, they had the pericardial effusion, all together. One may not see one in isolation. So just myocarditis. Sometimes there are patients, myocarditis, ischemic picture, as well as the pericarditis. It's, 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 a, it's a very complex again. And you can see that's normal heart. Uh, so beating normal heart, you can see the LV very contracting very well. And uh, so the, this is a patient with uh, uh, the myocardial. I'm sorry. And then, and so this is a patient with um, the myocarditis. You can you can see that LV contractions are usually is like 
uh, the, the, the globally affected. You don't see the proper, uh, the, the contractions, normal contractions. It is, uh, it is uh, globally uh, the hypokinetic. And so sometimes they go into severe heart failure. And so they can de develop congestive heart failure in patients with uh, myocarditis. And uh, so therefore, the diagnosis is very, very important, very early uh, stages. And so for the diagnosis, I think most important thing is uh, the, the biomarkers. Biomarkers, the, uh, the troponins are elevated. It can be above even uh, the thousands. And the CPKMB is elevated. And uh, so the, then uh, the, the ECG might show certain changes. Uh, usually you see STT changes. And uh, so uh, those, those are the things uh, uh, you should uh, look for. And uh, so, and so this is uh, this is something uh, the, the I uh, have to tell you that in investigation wise you have to do a I mean other than the echocardiography and uh, so you can do uh, even the MRI uh, scan cardiac MRI there you can see the the changes the hypokinetic areas very well as uh, intracellular edema as well as in long COVID, you can see these fibrotic areas uh, the, the, in the myocardium. As in, as in the lung, you can see the uh, ultimately end up in uh, the fibrotic uh, myocardium. And so then going into uh, the congestive uh, heart failure. And so what about myocardial ischemia, DVT and pulmonary embolism? This is also another manifestation of uh, uh, long COVID. And during even acute stage, you can have that. But uh, with uh, now they have found that even in long COVID, after three months, they can have uh, uh, ischemic heart disease manifestation. So, uh, the, so how do they get this? So there can be people with concomitant increase of uh, the already uh, developed plaque. They have established plaque, but with the concomitant increase in cytokines and inflammatory mediators, mediators could cause inflammation. And uh, so inflammation of the plaque itself, and it's softened, and then you can have plaque rupture. So you can have ischemic picture, either non-STEMI, STEMI, uh, or unstable angina. And uh, so sometimes this can be due to uh, the, this, uh, the, the biomarkers, uh, the, not biomarker, the cytokine stone. And so even the direct invasion of the virus could cause uh, immune reaction in the plaque and co uh, cause uh, plaque rupture. And also, Remember that virus can uh, the, the attack or infect the endothelial cells and the, the media and in adventitia. So therefore you can have a, the, the, the endothelial uh, the constriction, the uh, capillary constriction. And uh, so the, the result in uh, myocardial ischemia. And so this is a direct and uh, indirect uh, the causes. I mean, the virus can go and attack directly to endothelium and the plaque, or may not have a plaque already established, normal uh, coronary arteries, but still uh, the patient can have endothelial uh, endothelial endothelialitis and coagulopathy, as well as um, the microembolizations of the, um, uh, the coronary arteries, as well as the capillaries causing infarct. Uh, as well as uh, unstable angina or even uh, diffuse ischemia picture. And uh, so there is a risk of, uh, of a thrombotic event after COVID. And uh, so, I mean, acute coronary syndrome when you take in a long COVID after acute phase, you can, I mean, it's various reports give various uh, uh, the figures, so seven to 28%. And uh, so DVT is not that uncommon. So DVT and pulmonary embolism is about 5 to 30% in various series. And uh, so as I told you, the mechanism is either direct, uh, direct endothelial damage due to COVID virus itself, or maybe cytokine storms, immunological reaction related to injury, and maybe the systemic uh, inflammation itself, complement activation and coagulation system activated. By the way, remember this, but now they have recently found that even this virus uh, go and um, uh, binds to the platelet itself, and the, when the platelets get uh, the then platelets get activated, and then can could cause uh, uh, thrombotic event. So it's, it's it's yet to find out all these things. So we are still learning about this virus as well as the uh, sequelae and the complication with regard to cardiovascular uh, disease. So even this uh, shows you can see that uh, micro 
myocardial infarction. It can be micro, as I told you before, it can be a macro infarct. It can be micro infarct. This, this study, again, they have studied the, the, the pattern of the, uh, the cell necrosis. As well as you can see the, uh, the, the post-mortem study, you can just a big infarct and proceptor. And uh, so also you can see this um, uh, micro thrombi and the capillary, there are the a lot of the, uh, thrombi in the capillary. And then you can see the inflammation going on. So these are all you can find in uh, patients in poor, uh, acute stage, uh, subacute space, as well as uh, in chronic phase, that is long COVID situations. And uh, so this is another case I had highlighted. This young guy is about three weeks ago, um, uh, came uh, uh, half vaccinated. And uh, so no significant comorbidities, no coronary factors. He came here and he, was, he got COVID and he was in quarantine. And uh, so he got chest pain, very ischemic type, very classical. And he came late to the hospital and emergency care and National Hospital uh, Colombo. So we diagnosed extensive anterior MI. And uh, so this is what happened. Uh, the, uh, so this is what happened uh, so, uh, the, in the angiogram. And uh, so you can see uh, the, this view, you can see the, the, uh, the circumflex is intact, but you, can, you can't see it. Uh, LAD is totally gone. And uh, so you see now, people uh, did the, he was in cardiac shock anyway. So i not therapy not given because it's too late. And uh, so this is the, I could just uh, introduce the wire, wire itself opened the artery. And uh, so then, uh, so you can see now LAD is nice flow. And uh, so, and so normal, uh, the the the, uh, the reperfuse very well, and uh, so he, he was safe. And then uh, so this is a typical. There's no there was no plaque there, and this is a typical post COVID uh, or acute, uh, subacute phase uh, COVID uh, infarct. As you can see, the ECG also like um, uh, when he came as uh, significant ST elevation, and in anterior chest lead after uh, the, doing the angioplasty, you could see that uh, actually it has come down very significantly. So well reperfused. And uh, so this is all about uh, cardiac uh, ischemia. And uh, so what about cardiac arrhythmias? And cardiac arrhythmias usually could be due to various reasons. So it could be due to ischemic injuries, can be due to myocardial injury, cell injury involved in the conducting system. And uh, so there can be a catecholamine surge and uh, during COVID, maybe due to um, the, their anxiety about the disease, maybe due to the disease itself, because this virus can go and attack uh, autonomic nervous system. So they, you can have uh, bready and tacky episodes. And uh, so this is the, the, the basic mechanism. So, but most of the time we, we could see in these patients inappropriate sinus tachycardia. They, most of them after COVID, maybe after a few months, they, they come with uh, the tachycardia, very inappropriate. And at first they get tachycardia. This is the commonest cardiac rhythm problem in uh, post-COVID uh, patients. So this is the case, you can see the heart rate is like 100, 110. And uh, so this is uh, post-COVID patients and they usually complain uh, palpitation at first. Uh, so this is a POT syndrome. So now the, uh, by the way, even in uh, the arrhythmia, you can have various arrhythmia. The commonest is tachycardia. You can have SVT. They can have atrial fibrillation. They can have a cardiac arrest or went to the, the VT, VF. All that is so bizarre because you know the underlying mechanism. So there can be ischemia, myocardial necrosis, cardiac damage, myocardial. All these are triggers for uh, rhythm problem. It's, it's so bizarre. And so these are the commonest uh, ones I'm going to highlight. So this is another thing that I recently uh, described. It's called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, POT syndrome. This is an abnormal increase on heart rate with standing and without, without usually fall of blood pressure. And may be seen in other viral infections like influenza and glandular fever, but people have found that it's um, more common with uh, the, the post-COVID uh, situations. And uh, usually they complain lightheadedness with rapid heart rate, and they might even collapse occasionally with faintishness. And so they can't, usually these people can't ex do uh, exercise, especially treadmill, they can't even walk. So this is after a few months of COVID, by the way. And so usually treatment-wise, you have to advise them, support them with uh, stockings, 
uh, we have to advise them to take more fluid. And uh, so then uh, the, the exercises, they, they should not go on treadmill and running. So they should have like rowing machine. So like standing kind of exercise as a sitting kind of exercises and for a while. And so this is called broken heart syndrome. It's called, we must have heard this uh, uh, Takashubo cardioma, but this is described in Japan. You can see these people. And this is a due to a, the, the usually a weakening of the heart muscle due to severe stress and emotional trauma due to COVID. This can be due to COVID per se. This can may not be involved with the COVID. And so I'm talking about the post-COVID. And so you can get in post-COVID patients. So they have a lot of anxiety about their job, about their life, about their family, uh, everything. So they go through a lot of emotional trauma and stress. So therefore, they can, they can have this. I have seen a couple of patients, of course. So do you see the left ventricle in normal heart? You can see typical, uh, the Takashubo, the, the Japanese uh, octopus pot. And you can see the classical uh, the, the pattern or the shape of the enlarged left ventricle in this particular condition. And we, we have seen quite a few uh, last few weeks, actually, this uh, Takasubo, the broken heart syndrome. And so management wise, I don't think I would take a uh, lot, uh, lot of time here. General measures, we all know now that uh, general measures and then specific measures, of course, with regard to uh, the, the, the particular conditions. So all depending on the particular condition, whether the patient has uh, got uh, myocarditis, whether the patient has got uh, uh, the ischemic heart disease or uh, my all depends. but. One thing is certain. So you have to vaccinate these people. So vaccination prevent this long COVID, especially cardiovascular complication, because studies have very clearly shown and including the uh, lockdown. And uh, so in the management, I think we have to uh, uh, test these people. We have to assess these people. You have to try out these people. So patient chest pain during exercise, and uh, also these people, they complain. And so they could be possibly cardiac. So then you have to analyze them, screen them, counsel them. And so even difficulty in breathing and exercise, these are the common symptoms. And these, uh, the two groups of people should be carefully analyzed. You should not miss uh, a cardiac involvement. The fatigue, muscle ache generally could be non-cardiac causes. And uh, so, and though also the, some people complain of their increased heart rate, pounding of the heart, irregular heartbeat. Usually they are not having severe heart rhythm problem. And so therefore you don't need to worry. And then you do some basic investigations and counsel them. And uh, so echocardiogram is very, very important on these patients. So ECG and echocardiogram. And so you have to have follow-up uh, even uh, patients with full recovery. You have to have uh, follow-up uh, uh, echocardiograms and you can see actually, and people who have, who have been followed up and you, you, they have found that uh, LV dysfunction slowly starting in during post-COVID period and even zero to uh, the, up to about 18% in certain series. And diastolic impairment, this is a very important thing. Even young people after COVID, they can have a diastolic dysfunction. And uh, so this is an important thing that could be due to uh, post-COVID uh, situations. And even they can develop pericardial effusion and uh, right ventricular dysfunction. Now here, right, right ventricular dysfunction can be due to several reasons. One is uh, the pulmonary uh, issue that as the previous speaker highlighted, they can go into fibrosis, co pulmonale, and then right ventricular uh, dysfunction. And also that's uh, chronic pulmonary hypertension. I mean, these are the reasons. Also. Remember that these people are more vulnerable for DVT. So they can have a chronic thromboembolic uh, uh, condition causing severe pulmonary hypertension. So these are the, uh, the, 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 the these, these things, when you do echocardiogram follow-up, you have to assess these things. And also cardiopulmonary exercise test. Previous speaker again highlighted that oxygen desaturation after months of COVID uh, infection, you can have. And it's, it's a very common, I mean, the, the oxygen desaturation you can have even even 30 to 30, 30, 35% of patients, even during the, the exercise ECG testing, poor exercise tolerance, poor oxygen uh, the desaturation. So these, these are also, you can um, um, uh, uh, study, you can uh, counsel them and then follow them up with regard to respiratory functions, maybe chest x-ray or with regard to um, uh, the cardiac uh, uh, the the problems like uh, the then you should do regular uh, echocardiography uh, test. 
And so the vaccination, so there are, there are uh, reports actually coming. Uh, now vaccination has been shown to reduce the incidence of long COVID. And so people who are vaccinated, the, the chances of they going to uh, long COVID, they have found that it's low. So vaccination is very important again here. And uh, so if you are fully vaccinated, I think your chance of uh, going to long COVID is uh, lesser than in people who didn't have uh, vaccination. And so and it's lockdown, we know in addition to all these things, we always uh, talk about lockdown. The lockdown, as recently we, we are promoting lockdown. We had, recently had, we had a major uh, seminar with all these speakers and then how to go for a smart lockdown. That is a way forward. And so if you, that is prevent the infection and then prevent the COVID, the long COVID. And so it's very important, the, low, the, the smart lockdown. That is where we don't do harsh or hard lockdown. The, the stage-wise uh, lockdown, depending on the severity of the infection or, or rather incidence of the, the COVID um, uh, infection in the community or in the country. So you can have different, different stages like red, uh, maybe amber, maybe yellow, maybe green. So we are now at the moment in red, we are dreaming for green nature. So this is what we should do in prevention. As in conclusion, so the, we all know that low, the long COVID is becoming a major global health concern. We haven't seen, this may be the tip of the iceberg. So we are very much focusing on at the moment, uh, the acute uh, situation. But, the, but I have to tell you this, this is going to be a major problem. And the POTS is something new. It's a common manifestation when you come to cardiovascular manifestation among patients with long COVID. And uh, so, but still the reasons is poorly understood. And uh, the post-acute cardiovascular sequelae, the myocarditis, right ventricular dysfunction, myocardial ischemia, maybe pericardial involvement, and uh, so it can be seen. It can be seen up to three months, four months, even six months. And so follow-up is very, very important, as I highlighted. And so there is you know, this dissociation between the symptoms and the objective measures of cardiopulmonary health in patients. And it's a very significant problem because there can be people, they don't have anything. And so no symptoms. But when you do the objective testing, echo, maybe lung function test, as previous speaker highlighted, so you can you can find uh, the problem. So that's a bit of a dilemma. Why these people are going into this situation? They are they are, they are the, even the patient who didn't get uh, acute uh, symptom. They are, they were uh, the, the asymptomatic right from the beginning, but later on they emerge as uh, long COVID. It's a it's a dilemma situation. No one knows exactly how to solve this issue. So with that note, uh, I must thank again uh, for the audience and the, the panelists and uh, for giving me this opportunity and the patients listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Gota Beranasimha. Uh, our next speaker would be addressing on neurological complications. He is Dr. Kishara Gunaratna, consultant neurologist from General Hospital, Hambantutu. Uh, so Kishara, over to you. Uh, I hope... Uh... Everyone yes, can see my uh, screen. Yes. Yeah, we yeah. can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> uh, at the onset, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, president, uh, Dr. Akhmatratna, uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, and the council for giving me this opportunity to speak to you on uh, on a very timely topic on uh, post-COVID neurological complications. Uh, I thought we'll start with the uh, case history. Um, so this is a, 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 an actual case. Sorry. Um, so this is a 28-year-old woman who was diagnosed with COVID-19 four weeks ago. She had fever, cough, myalgia, anosmia, and, and, and a rash, uh, which was which was symptoms in keeping with her diagnosis. Uh, however, she continued to experience persistent symptoms of fatigue, lethargy, um, uh, yeah, inter uh, fatigue, lethargy, intermittent dizziness, and uh, tachycardia. She experienced a degree of positional retrosternal chest pain, which was alleviated by sitting forward. She also experienced increasing back pain, chest pain tightness and persistent dyspnea. The symptoms fluctuated unpredictably over the, uh, the next few weeks, 
uh, with no identifiable aggravating or elevating factors. She experienced, she experienced a number of cognitive symptoms, which included reduction in concentration, poor memory, non-specific head buzzing, uh, worsening of uh, anxiety, and brain fog. Uh, the muscular, musculoskeletal symptoms include the uh, resistic syndrome and non-specific, uh, sorry, resistant leg, uh, non-specific uh, uh, anesthesia across the hands and feet, and a generalized body ache. On examination, all the systems were normal, right? Uh, apart from uh, the cognitive assessment, which uh, demonstrated uh, uh, deficiencies in episodic memory uh, and registration uh, uh, were the two cognitive domains that were specifically affected. Investigations were normal, which included uh, HRCT, 2D echo, complete blood count, and metabolic screen. Uh, she did have a mildly elevated D dime. So just remember this type of history, or this is. Oh, the case history, which is a, a stereotypical history, uh, a very common presentation, uh, and and then uh, we we'll, we we'll, we'll discuss a little bit more about it in a little while. Right? Okay. Uh, with regards to uh, neurological uh, manifestations, uh, there 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 have been a lot of uh, neurological complications uh, that have been reported with COVID uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, and uh, and it, it, it's, it's quite a big spectrum ranging from uh, stroke, uh, encephalitis, encephalopathy, uh, uh, post-infectious kill and by, uh, and uh, uh, various types of uh, infective and para-infectious uh, neuropathies and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a large spectrum of neurological complications that have been associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, however, these, these have almost all of these have been focused on uh, the acute phase of COVID-19 or uh, the acute phase of the infection, which is generally considered uh, four weeks from the onset of uh, diagnosis or symptom onset. Uh, and um, the, uh, as you know, the SARS-CoV virus has a high affinity uh, for the human angiotensin converting enzyme or AC2 receptor. Uh, and it's reasonable to sort of postulate that uh, the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus has, uh, has neurotropic um, properties. Uh, and why we say that is in the sense it has the propensity or the potential to actually invade the central nervous system. And why we say that is because of the fact that the, uh, the uh, receptor which, in which uh, the, the virus has the greatest affinity is also expressed in uh, the neuronal cells and glial cells. Uh, and this further uh, demonstrating uh, the affinity to the the uh, cells of the central nervous system, the viral uh, affinity to the central nervous system is that in post, in a limited number of post-mortem studies, uh, there have been demonstrations of viral particles of SARS-CoV-2 uh, in both the cerebrospinal fluid as well as in the cytoplasm of the neocortex and the hypothalamus. And uh, the associated histopathology or the histology that was associated with this was that of, uh, of a neuronal degenerative pattern with necrosis, edema, glial cell hyperplasia, and uh, cellular infiltrate. So, uh, what, why we are um, highlighting uh, the this is the fact that uh, SARS CoV 2 virus has a propensity to, uh, there is some evidence to suggest that it, it can invade the uh, central nervous system. Right. So now, um, the, con the previous two speakers or panelists have all have elaborated uh, uh, on this uh, 
uh, long COVID syndrome is also called, there are various terms that have been uh, used for this particular type of syndrome, which include uh, the uh, uh, long haul COVID as well. And also uh, post acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So there are various terms that have been used and uh, it is generally considered uh, uh, neurological, pulm pulmonary, cardiac, and gastrointestinal dysfunction, uh, which can persist in the post-acute phase. Uh, and that's what, what they mean by either long, long COVID, and that, that has been elaborated previously by previous speakers. However, this uh, what is considered as post-acute uh, is still uh, debated, though there is uh, the Gen the current cons consensus or general consensus as uh, previously alluded is the fact that if symptoms either persist or come on after four weeks uh, and uh, they, they are considered forced acute or part of the long COVID syndrome. Uh, this can be again subdivided into subacute as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Amir Kumala uh, elaborated from four weeks to 12 weeks, that would be generally considered subacute. And after 12 weeks, it would be uh, 12 weeks to six months would be chronic. And then after six months, it would be considered persistent. Um, various studies have used various definitions. So uh, some have considered post COVID uh, manifestations of neurological complications as four weeks and some six weeks. So that's why the the difference between four and six weeks. Um, and uh, the whole premise is that the, of, of this particular cutoff is that, that, that substantial majority of patients completely recover between four and six weeks. Right, uh, so what causes, what can, uh, what is it, what causes this post-COVID syndrome? Uh, uh, and the, these are generally symptoms which can be related to either residual inflammation or uh, symptoms due to uh, organ damage during the acute phase, or it can be due to the impact of uh, impact of the, the virus or, or the viral infection on, on pre-existing health conditions, such as comorbidities, such as skin heart disease, um, uh, uh, diabetes, hypertension, and so on so on and so forth. And also the effect on, on uh, of uh, hospitalization per se, uh, the non-specific effects of hospitalization and prolonged ventilation, which is also called effects of post, uh, which is also called post intensive care syndrome, all of which can uh, sort of contribute to this post COVID syndrome. Um, and the pandemic statistics uh, currently, uh, Emerging, uh, uh, emerging data suggests that we need to uh, follow up these patients uh, closely uh, with regular screening for probable long-term persistent neurological sequel. Right, so these are the common neurological symptoms and signs which have been uh, um, uh, reported uh, in uh, a lot of the, the studies that are ongoing. Uh, and uh, these are the 10 most frequent neurological symptoms that have been reported. Brain fog, uh, again, a term uh, which, uh, which, have, which has been uh, frequently used uh, for uh, cognitive deficits, headache, numbness, tingling, uh, uh, <clears throat> loss of taste, loss of uh, smell, uh, severe muscle pain, dizziness, pain, and bird vision and tinnitus are all uh, common uh, and frequently reported neurological symptoms. Uh, it's uh, and you, one should also uh, sort of remember that there have been over six hundred symptoms that have been reported uh, up to now with uh, with various uh, studies. Uh, and on examination, the frequent neurological uh, signs that are elicited in these particular patients are that of short-term memory deficits, especially on the fourth item recall uh, and attention deficits uh, uh, when we test them by using serial sevens. 
so if you actually go back to the case that was uh, highlighted uh, at the beginning, uh, the patient had uh, most of these symptoms and what is uh, this, uh, is proportionate with regards to a single symptom would be the fatigue that is associated with this, with these symptoms. And because of these symptoms, there is also uh, effect on uh, the activities of daily living or ADLs. So, uh, so this is the proposed diagnostic criteria for uh, the neuro post acute uh, SARS COVID uh, com um, uh, infection or complications. So, this is the di di proposed diagnostic criteria. I don't know whether there is consensus with regards to this, but uh, as you can see, there are several categories uh, of uh, symptoms uh, on, on your left. And uh, you have neurologic, uh, neurocognitive, neuroendocrine, uh, autonomic dysfunction, uh, uh, symptoms and uh, clinical features, uh, and also uh, features involving the immune system and laboratory findings. Uh, so if you have two or three of the uh, 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 features of in, in, uh, in a single category plus three of the four um, symptoms that are that have been uh, mentioned in uh, on the on the right. For example, if uh, there is a significant uh, reduction in uh, or impairment in the ability to engage in uh, in illness levels of occupation or education or social or personal activities. If there's significant fatigue and if there's uh, neuromuscular symptoms such as chronic debilitating pain um, and neuropsychiatric symptoms uh, such as anxiety, depression, uh, <coughs> and so on and so forth, then we are able to diagnose them as neuro BAC. Uh, of course, they should have a, a documented history of. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection according to the WHO criteria and at the time of diagnosis they should have a negative PCR and uh, of course the exclusion criteria is that they should not have a uh, medical condition uh, causing chronic fatigue, psychiatric disorders, primary brain disorders, substance, uh, if there's uh, uh, a history of substance abuse, eating disorders, and so on and so forth. These uh, categories of patients, uh, uh, these categories need uh, are basically exclusion criteria for this particular diagnosis. So, if you actually go back to the pre the the, the uh, case that was or case history that which was highlighted at the beginning, this particular patient actually fulfills this these criteria. Right, so post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection, like other viral agents, it's not surprising that SARS-CoV-2 may lead to post-infectious syndrome, such as chronic fatigue or chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, however, and, and it, uh, however, the rate of post-COVID fatigue uh, report, uh, is much higher compared to the other infections, such as EBV, Q fever, Ross uh, virus infections, so on and so forth. So almost one in four post-COVID patients will need this uh, CFS or chronic fatigue syndrome diagnostic criteria at one year. Uh, and it's, uh, and the, the incidence uh, or the prevalence is actually similar to the previous pandemics of H1N1 and SARS infections uh, uh, in, our, in previous pandemics. And uh, it, that, it, that again is not surprising because uh, the SARS uh, virus and SARS-CoV-2 virus share a genetic uh, similarity of nearly 80%. And therefore, the complications that we expect are also probably similar to that of SARS. A little bit about pathophysiology, all of which are basic postulations. We are really, we are, we are really not sure uh, of the exact pathophysiology. Physiology. However, yeah, the uh, neurological uh, post-COVID uh, syndrome is attributed to one, there's a thought 
that there is a disruption of the hypothalamic uh, <coughs> the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, uh, and that is because of the the fact that uh, there may be a transient inflammation or hypophysitis uh, uh, in what. Uh, involving the hypothalamus, uh, and that is because of the fact that uh, the AC2 receptors are, uh, uh, are expressed overtly um, in these particular uh, neuronal in these particular neurons, and therefore there is this affinity for the virus to actually uh, bind to these receptors, uh, and as a result of this, there can there might be. Um, uh, central hypocortisolism uh, as well as low dehydroepiandosterone sulfate, which might attribute uh, the symptoms uh, and signs that uh, are elicited in this particular syndrome. There's also uh, immune dis uh, dysregulation that, that again was highlighted uh, during the post-acute uh, post uh, uh, period of, uh, of the of the infection, and there is there are uh, elevated uh, cytokine levels such as IL two uh, granulocytes found stimulating factor and IP ten, which might again be contributory to the development of this long term fatigue. There is also reported mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, again uh, as a, a, a pathophysiological mechanism in this particular syndrome. Uh, brainstem dysfunction again due to the the, the uh, expression of ACE2. There's there's uh, uh, propensity for the virus again to uh, affect the brainstem, which can again uh, cause autonomic dysfunction, which is again a prominent feature seen with this syndrome. So, what I wanted to highlight on in this is the fact that. Uh, there is a there is a care pathway where almost all the patients, whether they are they they were uh, hospitalized symptomatic uh, uh, or mildly symptomatic patients, need follow up, and they need to be followed up at six weeks. Again, uh, the primary uh, evaluation will be a, 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 a pulmonary and a cardiac evaluation. And once the pulmonary and cardiac evaluations are normal, it would be best to screen these patients for uh, this uh, neuro ES, EAC uh, with looking for uh, fatigue, neurocognitive and neuropsychiatric symptoms, as well as uh, symptoms of uh, peripheral nervous system involvement. Uh, uh, screening them for these uh, symptoms and signs are very important because we are we will be able to uh, impact uh, on early with regards to uh, rehabilitation and treatment. So this is now part of the care pathway of patients uh, being followed up for long COVID syndrome. Treatment again, there's not there's not a lot of data that's available uh, currently. So we would be again uh, shooting in the dark, uh, but they, there are some. There, there is some evidence to suggest that monoamine oxidase inhibitors like mocopamide uh, might work. But there was uh, there was a randomized controlled trial, but there was no difference uh, statistically. But there was some improvement seen in the symptoms. Methylphenidate or talin. Uh, was again used in a double-blinded uh, study, uh, which showed st some statistical significant uh, in st <coughs> improvement in uh, fatigue scores. So that it might uh, retaliate on methylphenidate might be a, a solution for the extreme fatigue that most of these patients uh, experience. Uh, the psychotropic drugs such as antidepressants, antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, and, and valproate, commonly used for uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, following post viral syndromes, can also be considered, though the, the uh, evidence for this is still uh, lacking. Uh, non pharmacological approaches such as CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. This, these are a list of. 
drugs which we generally use for my, my mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, dysfunction uh, such as coenzyme Q10, riboflavin, alpha lipoic acid, vitamin D, C, l carnitine and l creatinine all of which are, uh, are now have been approved uh, for the use of this syndrome mainly because of the premise that uh, that this may be uh, a result of or the pathophysiology involves mitochondrial dysfunction so therefore on that basis these nutritional supplements may be used as well for the treatment of this particular uh, syndrome Okay, so that's on uh, uh, the post-COVID uh, uh, neurological syndrome, which uh, which is a, a more of a neuropsychiatric manifestation of, of uh, COVID. What about stroke in post-COVID? Uh, COVID-19 is an independent risk factor for stroke and, and uh, that has been elaborated by uh, the uh, previous panelist. Uh, and uh, there are various mechanisms in which uh, uh, the uh, stroke or stroke can result uh, as a result of COVID-19. There, there can be invasion of the vessel wall uh, that, uh, of, by the virus, which provokes a coagulopathy due to endothelial inflammation. Uh, there can be myocardial damage that precipitates formation of clots intracardiac, which then uh, embolizes into the uh, brain. Or there can be destabilization of already pre-existing atherotic plants. So these can be; these are all mechanisms in which stroke uh, can occur, especially with uh, COVID-19 patients. And uh, most studies have reported high incidence of stroke within the acute phase, which is within four weeks of the onset of symptoms. Uh, a recent meta-analysis, which included over 100, over 100,000 patients, uh, found that the, the cerebrovascular uh, so found that cerebral vascular disease occurred in approximately 1.4% of patients. And the risk was higher in older uh, patients, hypertensive patients, diabetic patients, and in patients with ischemic heart disease and severe infection. Um, most of the strokes that have been reported were of large vessel occlusion with multiple territories being involved, and they were uh, strokes of severe nature which had a higher in-hospital mortality rate. Now, all these are uh, basically uh, strokes that were reported within the acute phase. Any, so uh, are there, is there a risk of developing stroke beyond the acute phase? Uh, so there's very little uh, evidence at the moment. So we're still gathering evidence uh, with regards to the uh, independent uh, risk of, uh, uh, of having stroke, uh, but uh, there, there was a matched cohort study uh, in Sweden, uh, which found that uh, the, the risk of stroke was highest within the first week of the onset of symptoms. Uh, and uh, uh, the risk did go down uh, progressively over the second and the third and fourth week. However, there was still significant risk even after four weeks of uh, the onset of symptoms, so uh, so there is a there is a risk uh, uh, of uh, having acute stroke even after four weeks. And again, this was uh, reinforced by another study or, or another case series of eighteen males, which had a, a median onset of stroke at two months uh, from the onset of symptoms. Uh, a recent retrospective study, which included more than 200,000 patients, uh, found that uh, there was an incidence of ischemic stroke um, of about approximately 2.1%. And this was this covered a period of six months for, following the onset of stroke. So, so there is an incident, there, there is a, an increased incidence of stroke uh, following. Uh, COVID-19 and and, may, and is a uh, thing to look out for uh, in uh, post-infectious of the post-acute phase of COVID-19. Uh, interestingly, they also found a, a, an increased risk of psychosis, cerebral hemorrhage, and also Parkinson's uh, disease. 
Now, uh, just to elaborate a little bit on, on the dementia aspect, uh, patients who developed dementia were the patients who actually uh, were, uh, they were older uh, and uh, they had uh, multiple uh, vascular risk factors and also the fact that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, those were often patients who had severe disease uh, and most likely uh, the hypoxia uh, as a result of the uh, severe disease would have affected the uh, hippocampal areas or the hippocampus, uh, especially the left hippocampus, uh, which would have uh, contributed to uh, the development of dementia. What about uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome? Um, so there is the, there is an incidence of Guillain-Barre, but again, this does not really occur uh, under the strict definition of uh, it, this is not a uh, uh, complication uh, of uh, of the post acute phase by strict definition if you take the four week cutoff value uh, but uh, I thought of in, in including this because this uh, is uh, we are, are seeing more and more patients of uh, with uh, Guillain Barr uh, in. Uh, yeah, either uh, in uh, mildly symptomatic patients or uh, asymptomatic patients who come uh, two to four weeks following the onset of uh, or from the from the diagnosis. Um, and uh, what we see is that uh, we see the predominant type of um, of GBS is uh, acute inflammatory demyelinating polyrad uh, polyradicular. Uh, neuropathy or AIDB uh, type of uh, GBS, which is the commonest type of GBS, which is seen all over the world. Uh, the, well, the, the immune response or the pro-inflammatory cytokine cascade is what we think is, is uh, the pathophysiology behind the development of, uh, of GBS in these patients. Uh, they are interestingly these are most often post-infectious where then we don't find uh, uh, the CSF is generally negative for the virus and uh, approximately one in three uh, would need artificial uh, ventilatory support. Uh, and they do respond very well to immunoglobulin therapy. Uh, there have been also other variants such as uh, Miller Fisher syndrome that have been also uh, reported with COVID-19 and is a complication of the uh, of a, a post-infectious co uh, complication of COVID-19. There is this new interest uh, with regards to de novo uh, epilepsy and status ep uh, status st status epileptic. So many cases have been uh, described with new onset focal seizures, serial seizures, and status epileptic uh, that have been associated with COVID-19. There was a Systematic review also recently, uh, which included COVID-19 patients who are young, uh, less than 18 years. They found that approximately 0.3% of patients had seizures. Uh, the proposed mechanism here again is that SARS-CoV-2 infection affects the central nervous system, activating a neuroinflammatory cascade that increases and propagates uh, neuron and depolarization. So uh, again, another complication that we need to look out for, a complication which we need to look out for uh, in patients with COVID-19. So in conclusion, uh, post-COVID neurological syndrome is a new syndrome of which more, much of it is unknown. Uh, it, it is composed of neurological sequelae following COVID-19. Uh, loss of taste, loss of... Um, uh, smell and headache are the most frequent, mildly persistent symptoms that are associated with this, this particular syndrome. Fatigue and cognitive deficits are common and can be extremely debilitating. Uh, Neurorehabilitation of these patients is challenging because there's, there's really no data to support uh, the uh, uh, treatment strategies. And of course, post-acute stroke and post-infectious sequelae such as GBS can be expected and needs further surveillance. These are my references. I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kishara, for that excellent presentation. Uh, so I think that we were able to 
have two uh, uh, sorry three important uh, uh, presentations uh, which showed us the similarities i mean the extent of the involvement of these three systems that could get affected following covid as well as the uh, similarities and the differences if, of involvement the uh, so if you could answer a few questions uh, the uh, i mean out of these queries that have been uh, rules. Uh, I mean, it, are we aware of the mechanism for anosmia and loss of taste, uh, uh, Kishara? Um, yeah, uh, the, the mechanism that has been proposed uh, is the fact that uh, the, uh, the initial um, uh, proposition was that the viruses uh, basically uh, go and uh, Basically, the, the S protein basically uh, combines with the uh, the spike protein basically combines with the C2 in the uh, receptor, which is abundant in the nasal epithelium, nasal epithelium, thereby affecting the olfactory nerve. Uh, that was the initial uh, uh, sort of uh, theory uh, that resulted in uh, anosmia, and actually they went on to uh, sort of uh, so, sort of uh, uh, describe it further and actually describe it as a pathophysiological mechanism for retrograde uh, uh, viral transport within into the brain itself. And uh, that was the premise of uh, uh, so SARS-CoV encephalitis. However, now there is, uh, there is a debate that you know, uh, it doesn't really affect the uh, olfactory nerve, but the, the cells, the mucosal cells uh, that surround the olfactory. Uh, so there is, there is this debate whether, whether it's actually due to the, uh, the very inflammatory uh, um, uh, manifestations uh, that, uh, are, uh, that cause the anosmia or whether it's actually direct invasion of the virus into the olfactory bulb. So uh, there is, we really don't know, but those are the two uh, proposed mechanisms. Uh, thank you, Kishara. Now is the uh, time for you all to advertise the post-COVID clinics. Are there post-COVID clinics for post-COVID patients in the Ministry of Health? I think Amila? Amila will have to answer that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sure you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Amila. Yeah. Yeah, so actually, uh, I mean, we started post-COVID clinics, uh, I mean, uh, about two months back, about six months back, actually, the respiratory units have started and we have ongoing post-COVID clinics and almost all the respiratory patients in uh, all over the country, I mean, they have their post-COVID clinics because that, uh, uh, I mean, we see an increasing number of patients these days with uh, respiratory symptoms coming with uh, COVID. So I'm sure as you can refer uh, to any area, I mean, almost all the district hospitals as as the national hospitals, they are having post-COVID uh, clinics uh, running on uh, on these day in, on these days. Uh, 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 could you just tell uh, whether the post-COVID or long COVID is it more in patients with diabetes? Yes. Are uh, there, what are the so, risk factors for long COVID? Yeah. So basically, what we, uh, as I discussed uh, in my previous model, I mean, uh, uh, patients who are elderly, age is one of the predominant uh, risk factors sex males are more than the females as well as uh, whatever reason if the patient is going into a hyperimmune state for example patients diabetes they see they are commonly going into this hyperinflammation state than the other people so therefore these uh, patients who are going into the hyperinflammation phase uh, diabetes and uh, other uh, chronic uh, non-communicable diseases and uh, these patients we see uh, quite a significant amount of uh, uh, post-coit syndromes and, um, and I, I want to tell that there's, I mean, even though we are blaming this inflammation uh, for this post-COVID syndrome, and there's a, another set of patients actually that who do not develop the inflammation, that is the patients who are immunosuppressed, especially the post-KT patients, as well as on uh, various immunosuppressions. And these patients, about 20% of the patients that who do not develop this hyperinflammation, that uh, their mortality is very high. So uh, this, this inflammation, it is, uh, there is some protection from this inflammation, but at the same time, if it is uh, very high, that is causing increased morbidity and mortality. Uh, the smokers, do they get more post-COVID? Uh, there are controversial actually studies on that. Uh, and uh, 
so few uh, studies has been uh, withdrawn because that uh, some uh, <clears throat> they have they were tried to kind of uh, say that when they have uh, especially the ex smokers there there is some uh, protective effect but uh, i mean uh, all the studies that uh, we, uh, we when we came together but we found these studies are pharmacologically biased uh, or industrial biased so therefore what i can say is uh, smoking is a risk factor for uh, post covid uh, syndrome so whatever the exposures not only the smoking um, Uh, maybe uh, exposure to various dust, uh, various uh, uh, fumes, and things are risk factors for uh, developing post-COVID ill. Uh, uh, Amila, I just would like another important thing because there was uh, uh, the ENT surgeons and even the neurologists were concerned of this uh, higher incidence of mucormycosis because the doctors uh, use steroids ad hoc. So I'm very glad that if you could again spell out the indications for steroids and the Places that we are, they should avoid steroids. Yeah, so definitely uh, uh, there are clear indications for systemic steroids. So if the patients are developing coit pneumonia and when the patients are hypoxic, that is the indication for systemic steroids. And if the patient at the early viremic phase, systemic steroids should be avoided at any cost because that is increasing the mortality that has been proven by the recovery and other trials. So you should not. consider starting systemic steroids once the patient is in the viremic phase then they are mildly symptomatic and we have increasingly seen actually people are using uh, especially the clinicians are using steroid nasal drops for the nasal congestion that they get due to covid at the initial phase that should be avoided at any cost i mean if the patients are developing nasal uh, congestion you might use some saline drops and things like that but uh, not to use nasal steroids uh, for the nasal congestion that we commonly see at the initial uh, viremic phase with mild symptoms as well as uh, <clears throat> continuous use of steroids for example uh, after 10 days of dexamethasone that has to be supported by with evidence that the patient is developing any interstitial lung disease or the patient is developing any organized pneumonia that has to be supported with some evidence rather than continuing on steroids after 10 days once the patients are hypoxic as we commonly see this nasocomial infections uh, among these patients with uh, uh, improper use of steroids so if i say that there is no place for steroids or dexamethasone for outdoor patients am i correct yes exactly i mean there is no place for uh, dexamethasone or steroids for outdoor patients unless started for post covid interstitial lung disease for acute covid there is no place Right. What is the place for statins and aspirin? Uh, there are actually some uh, studies, actually that uh, which has been uh, studied uh, on uh, aspirin as well as statin as well as ACE inhibitors and ARBs on COVID. But uh, uh, I'm sure that Dr. Gotabe will answer that question more detail. But what we know is actually there's no evidence to commence this uh, aspirin or statin. Uh, for patients with COVID, but if the patient is on uh, aspirin and statins, that we can continue these doses. But there's no place uh, for uh, commencing this treatment once you get COVID. Uh, right, Gotabe, yeah. do you want to yeah. comment? Yeah, I try to differ in opinion. And uh, the statins, of course, people who are already on statins, they should continue, especially people who have. Uh, got established atherosclerotic disease. They should be on statins. There are some anecdotes and case reports and small studies to show that people who are on statins they did they they fared well with COVID and their severity and the mortality um, or they improved. And but still we need to proper the conduct a randomized study. Uh, but the biggest question is aspirin. They whether they should be on aspirin or not. Again, it's a very controversial topic. For the time being, there are so many studies. There are meta-analyses. There are uh, the randomized studies, and uh, to show that in certain people, and uh, statin, the aspirin uh, might help. They are the ones who um, have got established coronary artery disease. I mean, they have established coronary artery disease in the sense that uh, they are diagnosed uh, of coronary artery disease. Of course, then you have to continue uh, aspirin in that, those patients, and also there are certain patients. So they are at high, they are high uh, cardiovascular atherosclerotic uh, risk, 
And uh, so the, the patients with diabetes and the smokers and age uh, 40 to eight, uh, 75, and um, the for this uh, Framingham criteria, you could categorize patients with uh, intermediate risk and the uh, high risk and the low risk. So patients with high risk of Framingham uh, criteria, if they get COVID, whether they are in the acute phase, subacute phase, or even chronic phase or long phase, you have to continue. By the way, they are not patients who have uh, established coronary artery. They run a high risk for atherosclerotic uh, heart disease. So you can do uh, aspirin, but not for others. And also even these people, the bleeding risk should be very minimal. Suppose uh, somebody comes with high uh, uh, the coronary artery uh, disease risk score and the bleeding risk is more and uh, maybe past recent history of gastric ulcers or something, and then you should not give. So you have to assess both. And so otherwise uh, you should not uh, give aspirin uh, to all these patients. Right, I think now is the time for us to conclude it, but uh, the, um, uh, uh, we actually spent a lot of time on questions as well. So uh, uh, the, let me thank all three speakers. All three presentations were excellent and then they all covered the most important areas of long, long COVID. We know that there are other areas that we were unable to cover like the gastrointestinal, but I think that uh, what is most important in our day-to-day -day clinical practice has been covered. I'm very thankful to all three speakers, as I mentioned in the early stages in, at the beginning uh, for uh, spending time on it and agreeing to share their expertise with our members who are very much interested in being up to date on this most important topic in today's context. So I thank you again for speakers. I thank all the, uh, all the members and others who joined this uh, webinar online. Uh, so let us uh, conclude it. Thank you again uh, for staying until, uh, uh, at the, until at the end of this presentation and uh, uh, stay safe. Uh, thank you. Thank you.